right away. Uh, it does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the ditch really is about the breath. And one of the ways that you learn to do is, uh, what you learn to do is called circular breathing, mm -hmm. which is a misnomer because it's really not circular. It's breathing area, and you heard me do that <laughs> in between, but while, that's be while I'm breathing it in, I'm also expelling air through my mouth. So there's, there's a reserve of air that goes through the, the tube, basically, because mm -hmm. it's a big, long, hollow tube. Uh, it's an instrument that's been around for 40,000 to 100,000 years, as old as the, as the Aboriginal culture in, in Australia. Uh, often it's a euca eucalyptus didge. Uh, there's eucalyptus trees growing all over the place there. I saw a eucalyptus forest when I was there. My friend Jeremy called it a didgeridoo forest. <laughs> And usually it's a, it's a eucalyptus that's been hollowed out by termites and then it's chosen for that reason shaped, formed, and as you can see from this ditch, uh, sometimes uh, there's artwork that's done on it. Uh, this artist is a particularly, Nawi is a particularly gifted artist, and it plays really, really well. Uh, I learned it uh, years ago, but probably about five years ago is when I started. I was just fascinated by it and frustrated trying to do the circular breathing. I try and try and try, and I had a spirit teacher come in at one point, and both basically what he would tell me was two things. Breathe and just relax. <laughs> uh, the key, one of the keys uh, to playing the didge, as I learned, was it's a rhythm instrument. It's not a, 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 a horn or a flute or anything like that. It's a rhythm. It's a one-note instrument. But as you heard, you can get different overtones. Mm -hmm. You can also introduce your voice, as I did a little bit, mm -hmm. and create different sounds and different sound qualities to it. Uh, you also, though, I, when I first learned, I, I learned that the, the breath or the pauses could be used as part of the rhythm. So it, I would breathe, I'd do something like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, breathe in between and it still maintained a certain rhythm to it. And then the funny part, then it's enough about the ditch, but the funny part is one day, I was practicing and trying this, and I talked to a couple people about it too, in addition to the spirit teacher. And I got it, and I went, oh my God, I've got it. And then I couldn't find it again. Yeah. <laughs> it took me another couple of weeks to find it again. It's like, get your mind out of it. Well, that's a teacher in itself. Breathe huh? and relax. So it's, a, it's, a, it's been a great uh, companion, and I, mm. I often do, uh, in my private consultations, my private healing sessions, sometimes I'll use a didge to go over a person's body and it sort of loosens up the energy and, and as you described it, it kind of opens the heart so that then whatever else uh, may be done on behalf of the client, uh, they're, they're that much more ready. Yeah. So this is only one of the tools that you use during your, your practices. Tell us about, before we get more into the details, what is, what would you say is your relationship to the earth, to yeah. Mother Earth? Well, the, um, earth? Uh, my, uh, 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 the latest uh, book is called Earth Magic and the latest oracle cards, Earth Magic oracle cards. And really this is uh, what Earth Magic is about. I, I really call the, the sort of the umbrella of what I do Earth Magic because it is really working with celestial and earth spirits. Um, the earth speaks to us all the time. There's a life force in every being on this planet as well as in ourselves and when we are able to tune into that life force in another being like an animal or a plant or a tree or another human being there's something interesting that can happen with that and that's that when we tune in at that level magic can happen when we collaborate with that life force in some way for instance collaborating with uh, spirit animals um, when an animal shows up in an unusual way or repeatedly, whether it's the physical animal or um, a symbol of the animal, mm -hmm. oops, <laughs> Mike's there. Uh, uh, the symbol of the animal, there's something uh, really special going on. And that is that 
it's not just the animal, oh, that's one perspective and one way of looking at it. Say, oh, look at that fox that just crossed my path. Or what about that crow that landed right in front of me? Or that hummingbird that buzzes right in front of me? That's one perspective. The second is that there's a life force in that. That's, that's, uh, I don't, there's no contest on that. There's a spirit or life force, a life energy, you could say, that's animating that being. Mm-hmm. Third, though, and this is where this is real key to uh, collaboration. It's possible when that animal shows up in an unusual way. Again, symbol or the physical animal. Let's say a dream. That's a symbol of the animal. That the spirit of the species is actually trying to reach you mm. through that being, that animal. So let's say uh, uh, I had uh, one experience where I was uh, getting ready. I'm a song singer-songwriter too. That's one of the other things I do. I like a little diversity. Mm-hmm. And I was getting ready a, year, a few years ago to go into the studio for my first time in many, many years to record some original songs. And I'm nervous. And I'm going, uh, you know, that voice that comes up always when you stretch yourself, you know, goes, what are you, what are you trying to think you are? You know, you're supposed to be doing this other stuff. You're supposed to be writing, etc. <laughs> So um, what happened right about that moment <coughs> is a grasshopper, who I haven't seen a grasshopper for years, a huge grasshopper about that big, came in through the open window or the open sliding door, landed right next to my computer, and I swear to God, looked at me. <laughs> you know, And I'm thinking, okay, Mr. Animal Spirit Guide guy, mm. what does it mean? And uh, what I was able to discern is uh, the grasshopper first, First thing, when I closed my eyes, I said, spirit, you know, grasshopper spirit, what is, what's the message? And I heard in that inner voice, take the leap, the metaphor for mm-hmm. what was happening. And then another, I, I did a little research too from uh, uh, a more uh, logical point of view or cognitive point of view, and I, I found out the grasshopper sings to attract a mate, so that just the word sings really was the one that jumped out at me as I go for it. So it was, you could say, God's way or Spirit's way of communicating to me through this particular being and the collective consciousness of all grasshoppers, or you could say the oversoul. Kind of like at Grand Central, grasshopper said, okay, send, all right, Jake, uh, jump in there now. Okay, jump right next to his, there you go. He got it. Okay, he's looking at you now. Okay, there you go. <laughs> trying to get a message to you, yeah. you know, that's, uh, from Grand Central. Uh-huh. So that's uh, essentially one way. Uh, animal spirits uh, can help heal us, you know, certainly plant spirits do. You know, a lot of the medications and medicines that we take, the herbs, supplements, etc., come from these. Our brother and sister plants, too. Because you're also a shaman, aren't you? I've been called that, yes, a shaman, amongst other things, but I've been called a shaman. and. Uh, the basis for earth magic really is uh, shamanic work yeah. and shamanic uh, philosophy as well as the methodologies. Uh, there's been a revival of shamanism in the last several years and I think partly due because uh, again earth, the earth spirits are calling for us to, uh, to be able to work with the earth in a different way and to relate to the earth. Uh, I've, uh, I've said again and again it's, it's in my opinion it's not that we have to save the planet planet does not need saving. What, what needs rescuing or remedying, uh, what needs to be remedied is our relationship with the planet. And we're in a very um, active revision of that right now. And to call on the deep memory that, for instance, shamanism provides mm-hmm. to be able to work with these, not just the, the earth elements, but the spirit of those earth elements, I think is absolutely critical. In addition to any celestial spirits, for instance, what I call celestial would be the archangels, Mm -hmm. uh, ancestors. I'm big on ancestors these days because I've been told that's part of my assignment now Mm -hmm. is to really continue to call in the ancestors. Mm -hmm. Ancient, ancient ones as well as the more immediate ones of the past three or four generations. And I I swear, uh, uh, Lilo, that uh, we're, we're, we're being helped. It's just a matter of opening our our eyes and our hearts and our minds. But that goes through healing, as you're saying, and we need to heal ourselves. What are the, some of the best methods that you find that we can heal ourselves by? Well, one is, you know, a very simple one is get outdoors. Yeah. You know, really relate to, don't think of just the plants and the animals as something here just for us. I think we're intended to be stewards of this planet, not dominators. 
So to have a stewardship relationship mean, means that we care for the planet. You know, we care for the beings of the planet as best we can. So that's one way we'll is get outdoors. Uh, go outside if you feel like you're a little uh, mm -hmm. toxified from, say, city energy or something like that. Is <laughs> get outside. You can do a very simple thing, which is stand, put your feet, bare feet, in the ground, touch the earth, and then do some breathing. And as you're breathing, ask Mother Earth just to receive any of the toxic energy that you might be carrying. And then with each out breath, you know, send it down her way because Pachamama or Earth Mother uh, will transform that toxic energy just like it does other kinds of so-called waste and turn it into new growth and new life. So that's one way. From the shamanic perspective, there's a couple of things that, that uh, are, are treatments that can be uh, done on behalf of someone at their request. One is called soul recovery or mm -hmm. soul retrieval. Mm -hmm. Uh, throughout our lives, our soul can fragment or dissociate aspects, and uh, sometimes those fragments will return and sometimes they don't. They stay away for safekeeping. My job as a, a soul healer practitioner, a uh, shamanic practitioner, is to uh, ask, uh, work with my guides, my spirit guides, my main spirit guides, and in, in what I do is I ask them, for instance, if I were doing a treatment with you, I'd say, um, uh, spirit guides specifically uh, two spirit animals that I work with power animals for this are my buddy Raven mm -hmm. and Wolf mm. and I ask them typically take me to that soul fragment that most needs to be returned and then they lead the way and I'll show uh, something will be shown to me in the way of a soul piece that's been lost I'll get information on it, why, you know, why the separation, why did you remain and not return. And then if I'm uh, successful, which I've always been up to this point, knock on wood, mm -hmm. that uh, every time I've been able to bring that soul piece back, sometimes they're ready to go and sometimes I have to negotiate a little bit. So uh, it serves its purpose too when it's not there. It's amazing. One, uh, I'll tell you one short experience was uh, a woman, who, 28 year old woman who when I asked my guides to take me, they took me to um, about a five-year-old soul fragment, or little girl, that was playing under the bed. She was playing under the bed with toy soldiers, you know, and having a great time. And I said, well, what, you know, uh, explained to her what was going on and that this woman wanted, you know, would like her to return. And she, she uh, basically asked that she be uh, better, taken care of better. And I said, why'd you leave? She said, just nobody was there. Hmm. Uh, nobody was there to care for her, comfort her, nurture her. Brought this piece back, um, installed this soul piece in this woman, and uh, then told her the story. She said, you know, that's pretty amazing because that's absolutely right. No one was there. I really had to take care of myself. And I used to play under the bed mm -hmm. with toy soldiers. So there's a confirmation that it I'm not just making this up or it's not just my imagination it's something much much larger than that and it's a privilege and an honor to be able to offer this kind of service to people yeah so that's one uh, I'd say one very substantial way that can help people heal from uh, the results of, of trauma shamanically there's other methods too but certainly this is one uh, and what would you say what can we do for Mother Earth right now what you can do is for instance um, uh, right Right now, even this is timely, but there's so much going on in the way of, you know, storms are increasing. Uh, you know, we've had this uh, recent experience with uh, Japan uh, where the, it's just uh, devastation. You know, the earthquake and then the tsunami and the nuclear uh, meltdown. And, you know, one thing is that a lot of people, uh, what I believe very strongly is that when things like this happen, whether it be a Katrina, uh, I Indonesia or Haiti or... There's, uh, we're, we're, it's in our face so much of the time, and we feel, because there's a collective wave that runs through the, con our, the collective consciousness, uh, or through the collective, as some say, and sometimes you can discern what it is, and sometimes you attribute it to something else, you know, like walking around feeling anxious and fearful and not knowing why, just jittery, not sleeping well, etc. So that's one thing, is to understand that you know that this is going on second is uh, when we stay in fear it's not doing anybody any good so um, to help the earth 
and certainly help not just the people but all the beings <laughs> plants animals and human I was I downloaded uh, in a uh, journey meditation I was given a ceremony to do and it was to for seven consecutive nights up to the equinox uh, it's actually March 20th but up to March 21st every evening at 8 o'clock this is what you do and I've also invited other people to do this and it's it's a great ceremony no matter what the purpose is it happens to be for this you light a candle you sit breathe meditate on the flame of the candle mm. and as you're meditating on the flame think of all of the people and things you love and once you'll know when it could be two minutes it could be 20 it's really up to you to discern this but what you do then is you take that feeling that you've generated of meditating on the light and love you put your hands up like this and put it in the direction of the the calamity whatever it may be in this case it's it's um, the uh, you know the disasters <laughs> I say disaster but it's a series of them yeah uh, to the to the west Japan and from where we are and what you do is you allow you you can visualize this stream that light and love through your hands and through your heart to those people in Japan and other beings the plant and the animal beings you do this for again as long as you f it feels right to you and then you take and you put your hands face uh, palm down to Mother Earth and you say to Mother Earth I forgive you mm. and then this is the clincher you ask Mother Earth for her forgiveness mm. and then the last piece I just did the first one last night then the other piece that came to me was expressing out loud my gratitude so that may seem like a very um, you know light sort of thing but it's not you know I invite anybody to do it for any particular uh, calamity that that involves the earth the other is just to care for the earth plant you know uh, I think what's really important is like take children out let teach them about the earth you know uncover that stone that's been sitting there for mm -hmm. a while watch all the little bugs you know mm -hmm. just get to know them uh, plant a garden you know you can if you live in a, a place where there's no land uh, to plant you can still I've done this before is I plant tomato plants in in tubs and in pots work with the earth yeah. get to know her put your hands in it put, put your, your hands in it, it. put yeah. your feet in it yeah thank her yeah do a blessing every time you eat you know if you can thank all the beings the plant and if you're a carnivore too or an omnivore thank the beings the plant and the animal beings buy organic it's a little more expensive but it's getting better but buy organic you know drink milk from cows th that don't get that growth hormone you know we don't want to support this um, treating animals humanely mm -hmm. you know and I grant that I'm, I'm a omnivore I, I a meat eater as well as a plant eater and some people say well you know we shouldn't eat meat well that's that's if that's your conviction then don't you know be a vegetarian but whatever we eat is something that has died unless it's fruit that's one of the exceptions those because fruits in your garden are awesome by the yeah, way the arbutus Where tree are they? aren't they delicious uh. arbutus or they're called spanish strawberries too i've never seen it before uh. but th what um uh, plants that give or trees that give fruit you know they give it very generously yeah. and the reason they do is it's the natural order of things is that when animals pick those up and they go somewhere else and they defecate they've just planted seeds so it it allows the the tree to propagate you yeah. know to continue on life for us it's not necessarily that but just thank you being grateful again I think is a real key doing a blessing every time you eat you know I thank the beings that uh, blessing that I do and I wish I could say every time I'm human so I don't do it a hundred percent but I really make it a point to do it as much as often is is say a short prayer um, of gratitude and it goes something like this typically I thank the beings all the beings mm. that have given their lives so that I may continue mine yet another day mm -hmm. and then I usually thank Mother Earth as well so those are some things we can yeah. do there's ceremonies we can do honoring the uh, full moon uh, 
new moon, the transitions, uh, equinox, solstices, etc. Get together with a community of people to to do um, any kind of ceremony uh, honoring the ancestors right around Samhain or October, the end of October, early November. Really? Why? It's considered to be, Samhain is a, a, a Gaelic, Gaelic uh, uh, term for that celebration, which is um, the belief being that at that period in the year, the veil is the thinnest, and that's when the ancestors come to visit us, so we can honor them by setting up an ancestral altar, for mm. instance, you know, and maybe put some of the foods and such that they like out and some of the artifacts and the sacreds that they they enjoy those are some examples of the way we can not only honor the earth but honor the beings of the earth so what would you say is the main message of ancestors right now to you um, there's coming through you or for us at this period call of time? on us mm -hmm. that's the main message call on us they want to help us i just spoke to somebody i did an interview earlier and she was saying that you know, she was concerned about her 16 year old learning to drive and her grandfather came to her and says, don't worry about it, I'm going to watch out for her. Mm. Things like that. They want to help us. Mm -hmm. We're in Western culture, we, unlike, I would say, the vast majority of cultures, especially indigenous cultures, but others too, we don't honor the ancestors. We don't pay attention to them. We don't call on them. And I guess that's a new aspect to my mission these days since that's been happening more and more is uh, to call on them, but also that they can, they can help with our healing. And that's the beauty, there's, there's just so much. I guess one, to take it another level is, um, mm -hmm. there's so much help that we can have from spirit world. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of having the openness and the, the willingness in our hearts and our, our minds and our soul to be able to call on these spirit beings to help us and, and not expect that it go exactly like I want it to. Because sometimes, as you probably know, I may ask for one thing and another thing shows up. Mm -hmm. This or something better. <laughs> so the surrounding, the allowing, the, the trusting uh, is a big component of our healing right now and the connecting with right. all, all spirit yeah. world. And the other element to that, Lilu, is that uh, we can, uh, I've said this before, is the, the earth speaks to us, it's just we've got to learn how to listen yeah. and to listen better and better. And, and that's a lot of what I think is important. And then the question comes, well, how do you listen? Yeah. Well, you listen with your eyes, you listen with your ears, you listen with your body, and you listen with your mind. And what that means is uh, messages come through just like the world comes through our senses. Spiritual messages come through no matter what the source, ancestors, angels, spirit animals, plants. Um, they, they come through any of those four modalities. Um, people tend to be really strong in one or two of those and then maybe the others aren't quite so developed but with practice in those one or two the others develop mm -hmm. example my main uh, uh, modality that I uh, lean on is both my hearing and my my body sensations or kinesthetics some say some call that clairsentient or clairaudient however over the years as I practiced it now I'll get images um, I'll, certainly as a writer I get you know the cognitive going I'll get messages that show up just knowing so if you can identify which are the strongest there mm -hmm. then you can start working with those a lot of people think well I, I'm not seeing things you know so I must not be very um, intuitive or psychic no nah, maybe that just isn't your strongest mm -hmm. maybe it's more about uh, your uh, your auditory capacities and being a, a communic you know, communication is a, my purpose. One of, one of three, teacher, healer, communicator. So it makes sense that auditory would be strong for me. So that's how you get messages. Um, hummingbird. Yeah, what is a hummingbird's message? Well, it depends. Uh -huh. and the, uh, I, I have, my book, Animal Spirit Guides, gives some suggestions. And these are ideas that are possibilities. Yeah. If you look up hummingbird in there, there's probably anywhere from six to eight Oh, it could mean this, could mean this, this. When you read it, though, one will jump out of you. Uh, one will jump out at you and go, oh, okay, got it. That's one way you can do it. Is you, and, and these tools are, are bridges, really, to developing that, that finesse, if you will, to be able to discern. Yeah. Another way is to say, like I said with Grasshopper, Hummingbird, what's your message? And then pay attention to whatever shows up in my, my eyes, or maybe my vision is directed somewhere. 
It could be in my mind's eye or outside. Uh -huh. Pay attention to what you're hearing, either that inner voice or maybe the important stranger that comes by and goes, oh, okay, that was the message. Pay attention to how you feel. And that includes, you know, any aromas that come to you, mm -hmm. uh, tastes, anything, anything having to do with the body, or just that thought that pops into your mind. Spirit will never tell you to do harm. Spirit will never tell you to do harm. If you're told to do harm, that's your ego in any way, shape, or form. And it just takes practice discerning between spirit's message and the ego's message. So, given that, let's come back here. Hummingbird. Quite often, the hummingbird's message is one of a couple. Lighten up. Mm. <laughs> you know, don't be so serious. <laughs> Lighten up like me. <laughs> the other is the flexibility. Uh -huh. You know, being able to move. Yeah. The other is, uh, w if, if you have to move or when you have to move, move quickly. Um, the other is, uh, just, just be a little lighter with yourself and with the world. Um, the other is to bring sweetness into your life. You know, you need a little more sweetness. And that could be bees, mess, honeybees message too, but it certainly can be uh, hummingbirds. So when that happens, it could be any of those four, or it could be a more direct and specific message that hummingbird is relating to you. Mm. And this one, this big one? Ah, Raven, my, my uh, <laughs> shall we say, co-conspirator or my power animal. Uh, Raven came to me, uh, power animal is, by the way, just to qualify that, yeah. is a shamanic term really, but it's not uh, exclusive to shamanism. Everybody has a power animal. We're born with them, but after a while they get bored because we don't pay, in our culture, we don't pay attention to them. We don't think that way. We think, well, it's a nice teddy bear, but, you know, is it also possibly a power animal or somebody had a giraffe you know is that my so um, discovering your power animal is one thing in shamanic work uh, over the years uh, I for a number of years as a psychotherapist I had owl because owls gift or medicine as it's called sometimes was to be able to see in people's shadows and that's part of the work not only of shamanism certainly but certainly with psychotherapy well owl sort of took a back seat when my buddy Raven came about two and a half, three years ago, he came in, uh, announced his presence, and basically told me, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working with you. Okay, so for me now, in this uh, cycle of my life, Raven is perfect. Because one of Raven's gifts is to bring from the darkness into the light that which needs to be seen. It's also, if you think darkness to light, that's a creative process. Mm -hmm. When I'm working on a song or a book or a project, something like that, often it feels kind of chaotic and I'm like dark and I don't know what's going on. Something's gestating, just like a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. You know, something's gestating. I, I know, well, I can't know what a pregnancy's like, <laughs> not this <laughs> lifetime, but something's gestating and it doesn't quite form yet. So I ask Raven to help me and it may not happen like that day or that hour, but eventually he'll help that come into form. And that's true with spiritual messages as well. Great manifester. And I've had many demonstrations of that. Uh, and I'm talking not just parking places, those um, <laughs> you know, eight, eight, out of, eight out of 10 times, you know, I'll get a parking place, but that's not, that's like parlor games. That's you not know. really your juice. Well, it's, it helps, you know, <laughs> believe me, you go downtown Laguna, try to find a place on a busy <laughs> summer day, it's great, you know, yeah. it helps, you know, but it sometimes shows up in unexpected ways or it's not exactly the one I wanted, that sort of thing. <laughs> so Raven is also a good guide when I ask uh, when I do someone's uh, uh, a soul retrieval on behalf of someone. Uh, Raven, as I mentioned, and Wolf are great guides. They take me there. They know how to deal with what's called the lower world, you know, where I typically go to find lost uh, soul fragments. Um, so Raven's been uh, been with me and has been a very good, very good power animal and spirit guide. And I do call on him regularly. Now what we're seeing here is, is a, a form that could be called a totem of raven. A totem uh, has a couple meanings. Often it's used interchangeably for power animal or spirit animal. It's okay, I, don't, I think I make a distinction. But it's also a representation of the spirit animal that you may work with. I have a totem here of the other yeah. main man. That's a wolf, a little soapstone carving of wolf so that I've got the two um, that help me probably the most. And then in addition, snake, snake, which is my other power animal. So those three are the main. Owl has taken a little bit of a back seat, shows up now and again, but those are the three power animals that I work with for different purposes. And how about this? What is this? 
That's a rattle. Um, I've got a drum here, and, and because it's a little damp, it doesn't play well. Its leather tends to soften and go blue, you know, mm -hmm. and it's wet. Um, this has got a raven on it. It's yeah. a rattle. It was gifted to me. Uh, it's got a little tuft of rabbit fur and some beads and some leather uh, with beads. Uh, rattling or drumming uh, is used quite often in shamanic work. It's not the only thing, but uh, the shaman's uh, gift is to be able to send, it could be his or her, but I'm going to use his because it's easier to talk that way. His uh, uh, capacity, his gift is to be able to go into this area of spirit world called non-ordinary reality. Yeah. And there he works with his spirit helpers uh, to uh, bring back souls, soul pieces, uh, to receive uh, ceremonies that he can bring back to enact with an individual of family or community or the world. Uh, just like I was telling you about the ceremony, you know, the healing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's different ways that he can induce the alter altered state of reality, excuse me, that's required. Uh, it could be singing, could be dancing, um, or one common way is drumming or rattling. Drumming, and I'm going to call it drumming, even though you could substitute the word rattling, is typically done about four to seven beats a second. Very monotonous, boring. Now I've also done hypnosis for 35 years and that's one of the things how you induce a trance in hypnosis, you bore the person till they're gone. <laughs> you know, what that does, seriously, what that does is that the brain waves slow down. Uh -huh. So this four to seven beats per second after about 10 minutes, it's been scientifically proven in more than one research uh, project that if you listen to this kind of monotonous beat or rattle for about 10 to 12 minutes, what happens eventually, oh, I'm losing you already, see? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, that's what happens is that what happens is eventually your brain slows down from the beta cycle, which is 14 cycles per second and above, and will slow down into alpha, which is that kind of drifty, dreamy state. You know, you're, you're still awake and alert and you know, everything, but you're a little bit drifty, like how you might feel when you first get up or just before you go to sleep. The fascinating thing with this research, research has shown with this kind of a rhythm is that um, eventually the brain will dial down to what's called a theta rhythm, which is four to seven cycles per second, mm. four to seven beats per second. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. There are also some studies that suggest that um, with uh, meditators like Buddhist monks, etc., that suggest that when someone is in that theta state, they really have, uh, the veil is very thin. Mm -hmm. between this mundane, regular reality and this alternate reality that we could call spirit world or in shamanic terms, non-ordinary reality. Um, the shaman's job, whether through <laughs> this or singing or like Tibetan shamanism, I did some training in Tibetan shamanism and the uh, facilitator, the trainer, he was, he had beads and bells and you know, was drumming and singing all at the same time to induce a state. Sometimes shamans will go to sleep and they'll do their work in their sleep. Not me, but some shamans will do that. So there's different ways to access this. Um, and how is that word, that world? How is it when you're um, down there or up there, wherever that is? That's a good is? question, Lilu. It's um, essentially most, many cultures, I won't say most, but many cultures that um, are shamanic cultures will uh, think uh, will describe the the world, the non ordinary world or non ordinary realities, having three uh, distinct worlds, mm -hmm. and that's the lower world, the middle world, and the upper world or celestial. Not not underworld. That one's a little too loaded. You hmm. know, it's the lower world. Lower world is one uh, when you find a place that is anything that goes down. It could be a, a knot hole in a tree, it could be a cave, it could be like Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a, a lower world journey. Mm -hmm. So the shaman's uh, job would be then to journey using drums, rattles, singing, etc. to this place that is an entrance into the lower world. And you go there and it looks pretty much like this world. 
all those you know very strange things happen <laughs> mm. more so than here as mm -hmm. if this isn't strange enough but you know very strange things but it's also very uh, you can navigate it pretty readily you always take your power animal with you mm -hmm. you know at least one of them maybe more but at least one of them you take your power animal the shaman will journey to the lower world typically there's that's where the animal spirits are mm -hmm. you know the spirit animals are uh, that's where Typically, I go to uh, find the lost soul fragment. Not always, but that's more often than not. Of the uh, three worlds, the middle world is this world. Uh, let's say if uh, someone, I know my sister just contacted me and she's with a friend who's dying of mm -hmm. cancer, you know, is on the, you know, a week or two to go, as predicted by the doctors, the physicians. So I, I said, I only if he agrees to this, I'm happy to send, ask my power animal, Raven, to come over and help um, tend to him or just to watch over him or to help him have that certain power that may be needed to, to transition. Mm -hmm. um, middle world would be, again, any uh, calamitous event that occurs in the world, if it's appropriate to send a, a power animal or two over there or to send uh, prayers, that's the middle world. Okay, a middle world journey be I might go to see Aunt Jane, you know, if she's ailing in some way or to visit with her. Uh, that's the middle world. The upper world, or sometimes called the celestial, that's where the human looking spirits reside. Our ancestors, archangels, I've met Merlin there. I've worked with Merlin mm, on cool. more than one occasion. You How know, cool must that be? It's, it's very cool. Um, now, it isn't necessarily that every uh, shaman or shamanic practitioner has the same map or has the same uh, people or spirit animals, but for me, that's one of the main ones in the upper world. The other, uh, the other one is a spirit guide that's been with me, actually turns out, most of my life. Uh, his name, which I can now say, he wouldn't let me say it for several years, but uh, he would just, I would refer to him as grandfather when I'd speak about uh, him, but he's allowed me to say his name. He said for a few years, he said, if, if, I give you, if, if I give you permission to say my name publicly, you're just going to, your ego's just going to take charge of it. And, mm. You know, make it a big deal. Mm. It's not a big deal, but he's allowed me to do that. His name is Ana Ooto. And it's, a, I don't know what language it is or what, it, I, I do know what it means, but I don't know what language it is. He showed up to me in an initiatory experience on a mountain in Big Sur, California, mm. uh, a mountain a thousand feet up. And two or three years later, I did a process with a shamanic colleague and learned that he really was with me since birth. I died when I was six months old, and I wanted out. <laughs> oh. And I was told I had, I don't know if, I don't know any reports uh, that say I died, but I did know that I had uh, pneumonia in both lungs, and as my mother told me, we almost lost you. Well, they did. Huh. And in this vision, I went to the light. The tunnel, you know, is often reported. You said you've talked to somebody about near-death experiences. Yeah. I go to the light and says, I don't want to come back here. <laughs> you uh -huh. know, let me out, let me out. And there he was, the one I met on the mountain, on Oto. And he leaned over and he said to me, not yet, uh -huh. not yet. Uh -huh. So I said, oh, come on, let me out of here, dude. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, and he did this three times. So that's where Ana Oto lives, that's where Merlin lives, there may be other archangels, um, ascended masters, you know, anything that's you could say human looking is in the celestial or the upper world. And I basically rely on my spirit guides to take me to wherever I'm needed for a particular thing. I probably journey in the lower world more than uh, the upper, but uh, there's no, uh, there's really no difference in terms of uh, you know which is more valuable or better and there's no no comparison like that it's just uh, you know where you feel the most comfortable uh, one of the main teachers that I know of um, apparently journeys mainly to the upper world and another one journeys almost exclusively to the lower world so mm. it just it doesn't matter so those are the three worlds anyway in non-ordinary reality and that doesn't take energy away from you you're if actually anything it's restorative yeah uh, especially again power animals you know yeah. they provide a, a that sort of power, that energy, that uh, um, uh, they supply that basically as well as their guidance. And when I'm doing healing ceremonies or healing work on behalf of someone, whether just one-to-one -one or in a group uh, process, uh, if anything, yeah, I get a little tired afterwards, but I'm also like very alert. Mm. I feel like I'm wide awake and, you know, my body may be a little tired, but my spirit feels really strong. 
Uh, so that's one of the reasons I love this feeling. work. Yeah, yeah. Mm, well, it's been such a delight to spend this moment with you. Well, thanks, Lulu. You're an exceptional interviewer, too. I appreciate that. Oh, so. this is easy Thank with you. people like you. I really <laughs> loved it. This is awesome and very different than another interview, another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. You know, another piece to bring us more full, more vibrant and uh, alive and ready to take on leadership i think is really needed right now absolutely and, uh, i agree with you totally we all need to let uh, retrieve our soul you know and fully yep. uh, let it out and speak yeah. out its purpose and yeah you know when uh, when i am healed i am not healed alone mm -hmm. and i i'm it's the only thing i really have retained from the course in miracles well it's not the only thing but it's one of the main things when i am healed i'm not healed alone when i am at peace then a, a peaceful world appears before me and especially, I would say, just as a closing piece, is mm -hmm. whatever you can do to release the fear, you know, and go boldly into the next moment, the next moment, the next moment, and go with love. That's really where it's at. You know, it's been said over thousands of years, you know, what's the real key? And only, as a friend of mine says, only love is real. Only love is real. Mm, I love that. <laughs> Only no love is real. This is it. Oh, yeah. yes. Thank you so much, Stephen. You're welcome, oh, Lily. Thank you very much. Much love, my beautiful go-greeters. <laughs> <laughs>